proof by what she says. You know, there's conversations and there's conversations. But she has the conversations on tape. These prosecutors, if you don't fit, you're going to have trouble. So much so that Mr. Darden is questioning her. Remember her famous response? Quote, why are we having this adversarial conversation? Why do I detect this negativity? I'm just here to tell the truth. Aren't you in a search for truth, Mr. Prosecutor? She said that. And then they wanted to ask, well, why didn't you stop him from using this so-called N-word? She said, I was in a journalistic mode. I didn't try to stop him from using that word any more than I tried to stop him from talking about cover-ups where male police officers have no respect for women police officers because they don't cover up the misdeeds. But that was her testimony. From that witness stand, you saw her. She's credible, don't you think? She has tapes to back her up. But look how she was treated by this. And Mr. Darden said something very interesting today. He said, I'm just the messenger. Now, now how many times have you heard that? I'm the messenger. Don't blame me. I'm just doing my job. That's no way out. He's a fine lawyer. But he can't hide behind just being the messenger. Well, whose message is he sending? Who is he representing in this message? He's a man of integrity. That statement is not going to fly. I'm just the messenger. He's not any messenger. He's the prosecutor with all the power of the state of California in this case. We're not going to let that get away. They're not going to turn the Constitution on its head in this case. We're not going to allow it. And so now, let me bring you to a segment of this discussion where we talk about if you can't trust the messengers, watch out for their message. Van Adder, the man who carries the blood. Furman, the man who finds the glove. Remember those two phrases. Van Adder, the man who carries the blood. Furman, the man who found the glove. Now, Detective Van Adder has been a police officer for 27, 28 years, an experienced LAPD robbery homicide man. He was put on this case because of his experience, presumably, because they had the resources downtown. You know what time he got there and knew what happened. One of the things that has been totally inexplainable, unexplainable to me is the fact that here you have Mr. Simpson cooperating fully, gives his blood. He gives eight cc's of blood, we now know. Van Adder, the blood is then turned over to Van Adder. Now, we know that he could have booked that blood in Parker Center, or he could have gone over to Piper Tech. You see these two residents here. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. And, Your Honor, this is, uh, OK, this is just the board. Apparently, it's not a number on this. He's at Parker Center, right over here in the police building, right down here at 150 North Los Angeles Street. Takes this blood. Could have gone a couple of floors and booked the blood that manual requires. But he didn't do that, did he? Could have gone over to Piper Tech, another facility right downtown here, and booked that blood. This is the reference sample of Mr. O.J. Simpson. He doesn't do that. What he does is he goes way out to this area marked Brentwood Heights. Must be 20, 25 miles, 20 some miles to go way out there carrying the blood in this unsealed gray envelope, supposedly. Why is he doing that? Why is Van Adder carrying Mr. Simpson's blood out there? Why is he doing that? Doesn't make any sense. Violates their own rules. Why is he doing that in this case? Has he ever done that in the other case? No. Name another case where this has happened. Well, you can ask him those questions all the time with Bushy. Officer Bushy, when have you ever sent four people Four detectives over to notify somebody who's not even the next of kin. Well, Mr. Carkin, there must, must be somebody, but I can't name you a case. There are no cases. These are the things they did in this case. So he goes way out there with that blood. Why did he do that? It doesn't make any sense. And so we know because we can. Much of what happened here is on video. It's the strangest thing about this, this blood. He can't explain either why he carries it out there. And then it gets even stranger, doesn't it? Because supposedly, 
after the blood is carried out to O.J. Simpson's residence, Van Adder gives the blood to Fung, according to what we hear. But Fung then uses some kind of a trash bag, a black trash bag, and gives it to Mazzola, but he doesn't tell her that it's blood. Isn't that bizarre? Remember the video when Mazzola's walking along, carrying it, almost bumping into the, 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 the hedges and the shrubbery? It's the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. She doesn't even know it. And then, talk about cover-ups, Mazzola's asked, well, do you see, did you see when Van Adder gave the blood to Fung? And she says, uh, no, I had sat down on the couch and I was closing my eyes uh, in Mr. Simpson's couch at that moment. I, I wasn't looking at that moment. Sound like a cover-up to you? Always looking the other way? Not looking, don't want to be involved? Covering for somebody? It's bizarre. Absolutely bizarre, and it's untrue. It doesn't fit. So Van Adder, the man who carries the blood, starts lying in this case from the very, very beginning, trying to cover up for this rush to judgment. Those are words. That's rhetoric. Let me prove it for you. He tells us, and this is a board. The board's entitled Van Adder's Big Lies, the man who carried the blood. He tells us, that O.J. Simpson is not a suspect. That's the biggest lie we've heard probably in this entire trial. O.J. Simpson is not a suspect. They handcuff him within 30 to 45 seconds of the time he gets back here. He lies about that. Weitzman succeeds in gets him, getting him unhandcuffed and they take him downtown. But he does more than that. Not only does he lie about that at the beginning, he then feels comfortable enough to talk to these two brothers, the Fiato brothers, and an FBI agent named Wax. And isn't this bizarre that a, the lead detective in this case, put on here because of his experience, is talking with these two guys who've been in this witness program for quite a while testifying for the government. Now we know that in a rather unusual set of circumstances, they're in a room somewhere in some hotel drinking beer. It's not even Van Adder's case. And they're sitting around talking. And I asked the FBI agent, weren't you a little surprised that a detective would be talking to these two people about the Simpson case? Well, we found out that there was a relationship allegedly between Denise Brown and one of these brothers, and maybe he felt comfortable. But why would he do that? And what does he say? He tells them that we didn't go up there to save any lives. O.J. Simpson was a suspect. The husband is always the suspect. But then he comes into court here. This lead detective takes the stand again and lies to you under oath. He says, oh, well, no, I never said that. Never said that. That'd be a mistake if they said that. I, I never made that statement. He lied. He lied from the very beginning. He lied when they went over there. Then they bring in Commander Bushy, an otherwise good man. They get him involved in this. Let me tell you something interesting about what you heard about Phillips' voice. Phillips was talking to the coroner's office about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning on June 13th. The man asked him to identify, well, yes, we have one male, female, one, one, one white female, one white male, uh, as though he didn't know the names or whatever. Now, this is five and a half hours after Bushy said, go over and notify O.J. Simpson, who's not even the next of kin because we don't want the family to find out about this like they did in the Belushi case. Remember he said that? Now he's doing all this from his house, from his, from his home. Phillips, if you look through his testimony, look back through your notes as to when he says he knows who this person is. But isn't it amazing that the children are already down at the station? They're at, at her house. They got a phone with a speed dialer. They know. Bushy knows. They don't follow his orders out. They stand out in the street, not investigating. Stand out in the street, planning, doing whatever they're going to do. But one thing they do, they decide that O.J. Simpson is a suspect in this case. And let me tell you why you're going to know that. They want to talk a lot about 1985, but he missed the whole point. In 1985, something interesting happened in this case. In 1985, Mark Furman responded to a call 
on Rockingham. Mark Furman is a lying, perjuring, genocidal racist. And from that moment on, any time he could get O.J. Simpson, he would do it. That's when. It started in 85, when Farrell asked all the officers at West L.A., or 10 of them, you know anything about this residence? Only one steps forward. And what does he say? It's indelibly impressed in my mind. That call back in 85, four years later, sits down and writes a report. And now, he knew what he was going to do on this particular night. So, O.J. not a suspect, went to save lives. They wanted to get a search warrant. That's why they were lying. Denies the statement to Wax and Fiato. Then, to get that search warrant, he lies to a judge. He says in the search warrant that O.J. left unexpectedly from Chicago. And there's some writing on the search warrant. I think it's in evidence. And it's kind of interesting. Because everybody knew. Cato knew he was going to Chicago. Everybody knew he was going to Chicago. It wasn't any unexpected trip, but I suppose it would help out. In fact, if you think about it, as Clark said this, well, that's why those socks were out there and everything, because he left in a hurry, like he had one pair of socks. We know why those socks were out there. He left unexpectedly to try and justify what they were doing. It all comes back to Furman when he says in that letter, if I see an interracial couple, I'll stop them. If I don't have a reason, I'll make up a reason. This man thinks he's above the law. And even Darden, Mr. Darden, Mr. Christopher Darden, my friend, has to admit, he said it was textbook what's happened to their witness, not our witness. And so he lies to the judge. He lies to the judge. He's lied to you, his jurors. Then he says that Arnell and Cato said O.J. left unexpectedly. That's written in the warrant. They were saying they can. Cato knew this was a planned trip for Hertz. He talked to Kathy Randa. Then in the search warrant, he puts that it was confirmed there was human blood on the door. That's never been tested, even to this day. Another lie in this search warrant. He denies telling Thompson they ordered to handcuff O.J. Simpson. Then he lies about O.J. Simpson's blood. Remember during his testimony, he got that blood about 2.30, and he was trying to push it back an hour, so well, like, maybe 3.30, because he had to explain. It was it's hard to explain those hours in there. What's he walking around with this man's blood for? for? For three hours before he goes back out to Rockingham at 5.30? What's he doing with this blood? So he has an hour in there, and you look at his testimony, he lies about it between 2.30 and 3.30. Then Furman testifies between these two. I don't know who you can believe. When Furman testifies, something about that when he talks to Cato, Cato tells him about these thumps, that he doesn't tell anybody about it. He's so central to this case. He's got to be the big man and go solve this entire case. He doesn't tell the rest of them. Remember, he goes off all by himself for 15 minutes. Just walking around, he goes off by himself somewhere, supposedly where he supposedly finds this glove. No opportunity? We'll be talking about that. But Van Adder comes in and says, well, yes, the Furman told me about the thumps on the wall, contrary to what Furman had said. So these are the lies of the co-lead detective in this case. If you cannot trust the messenger, you can't trust the message that they're trying to give you. You can't trust the message. So this man who starts to lie from the very, very beginning. I'll leave it up just a second. We covered the lies and the things that he did. And then they rope in Commander Bushy to try to back him up by saying, well, I'd ordered them to do this, a direct order to do this. But isn't that interesting now? Let's think about this. You look at those logs and see how many police officers came out to Bundy and Rockingham, maybe more than 30. You think that of those number of officers, that maybe one of them, maybe one of the patrol officers could have went to give the notice. It took all four detectives, all four LAPD experienced detectives to leave the bodies. They had notified the coroners. They didn't have a criminalist to go over to notify O.J. Simpson. Who's fooling who here? 
This is preposterous. They're lying. He's trying to get over that wall to get in that house. If you don't believe so, you're talking about saving lives? Remember what Arnell said. First of all, they all make this big mistake. They forget, and they say, well, when we leave from the back, we go right in that back door of the house there. We go right in the back door. But they forgot. Arnell Simpson comes in here and testifies, you can't go in the back door because, remember, Cato had put on the alarm. You had to go around the house to the front. Arnell had to open the keypad to let them in. Remember? You think who knows better? You think she knows better or they know better? She had to open the door and let them in. They're so worried about dead bodies and people being in that house and saving lives. Who goes in first? Arnell Simpson goes in first. These big, brave police officers. And the young lady just walks on in there first. They don't go upstairs looking. They just want to be inside that house and make her leave. Or give Furman a chance to start what he's doing, strolling around the premises and doing what he's doing there. Then we come to Detective Phillips, a nice man, but even he makes misstatements in this situation. Now, he knows Furman probably better than anybody because he's the one who calls Furman. He's the one who works with Furman. Now, Furman, in the culture of LAPD, has been promoted. We have heard that in 85, when he goes out to this incident, he's a patrol officer. Now he's a detective moving up in the ranks working with Phillips. And Phillips calls him after 1 o'clock. The firm has been somewhere down at La Quinta in the desert. And he comes back supposedly. And he gets his call to respond to this location. And even Detective Phillips, in this case, and I examined him, when asked, well, Furman told you, didn't he, about his going out on that call in 85 about this so-called domestic discord and then the 89 situation. You knew about that, didn't you? Phillips, oh, no, no, no. I never knew anything. Nobody told me anything. I don't know anything about that. No, no, no. I didn't. And then Lang comes in here. And in Lang and Van Atta's report, right in the report, and it's in evidence, exhibit 1021, Lang directly impeaches Phillips. That Phillips did tell him about the 85 incident. The, the firm had told him he'd been out on it. And why would he do that? Now, these are facts, ladies and gentlemen. This is what happened in this case before your very eyes. Not anything I'm making up. And who would know Mark Furman better in this case? His lack of credibility, his lying, racist views than Ron Phillips, his supervisor, who apparently chose to look the other way. And I'm sure he's as embarrassed as anybody else by this disgrace, Furman. So it's important at the outset that we understand the role of Phillips as we need to understand the role of Van Anna. He was the one allegedly given this order by Bushy to go over and give the death notification. He didn't comply with it until much later. And presumably the reason they were going to go over was to give the notice to Mr. Simpson and Furman was going because he was needed. Now can you imagine this? Furman with his views, genocidal views, was going to go over to give notice to O.J. Simpson to help O.J. Simpson in his time of need. Can you imagine that? He's going over there to help him, help him with his kids. That is ludicrous. So from risky to bushy, you've seen and are seeing a part of this code of silence, this cover-up. The cover-up that Laura McKinney talks about, where male officers get together, cover up for each other, don't tell the truth, hide, turn their head, cover. You can't trust this evidence. You can't trust the messenger. You can't trust the message. When Furman gets on the witness stand, says, I haven't used this N-word for 10 years. Think Phillips knows he's lying? Some of you probably knew he was lying. It took those tapes to make those of you who didn't believe these kind of things exist to take place. 
didn't he have an obligation to come forward under those circumstances? For if Furman would speak so candidly to this lady that he met in a restaurant in West L.A., you think he talks like that to the guys on the force? She talked about, he said those words in police administration and police procedures. That's the way he talks. That's the way he is. Nobody came forward to reveal this. We revealed it for you. Now, let me just take a moment. This whole thing about the police and what they've done in this case is extremely painful to us and I think to all right-thinking citizens. Because you see, we live in Los Angeles and we love this place. But all we want is a good and honest police force where people are treated fairly no matter what part of the city they're in. That's all you want. So in talking to you about this, Understand there is no personal pride, but I told you when we started, this is not for the weak or for the faint of heart. And so let's move on then. Just wanted to show you this uh, part from Detective Phillips. This is what was asked of Phillips at 15084. Mr. Simpson and Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson had been embroiled in previous domestic discord situations, one of these resulting in Mr. Simpson having to go to court. You told them that too, didn't you? Answer, Phillips, I never told him that. He's talking about to Lang. So if, my question, if Detective Lang so indicates in his report, he's wrong. Answer, if he tells you that, I told him that, he may have learned that from Detective Furman, but he didn't get, didn't get the information from me. I never knew that. Then when Lane came in, I asked him the question about this, this same area. I asked Lane this question. So let's look at it together. Does that report indicate that Phillips stated that victim Brown was the ex-wife of O.J. Simpson, the well-known athlete actor? Answer, yes, it does. And does it say, additionally, Phillips stated that Mr. Simpson and victim one had been embroiled in previous domestic violence situations, one of which resulted in the arrest of Mr. Simpson? Does the report say that? Yes, it does. And he goes on to talk about Phillips told you that, didn't he? And he goes on and says, but he told you this before you went over to Rockingham. Isn't that correct? Answer, yes. And so, even Phillips was then impeached. And then Phillips tried as best he could to be a team player. It was, seems as though they got together and he, Ms. Clark tried to make a big thing out of this, but here's how he described Mr. O.J. Simpson when he told him that Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson had been found dead. What do you mean she's been killed? Oh my God, Nicole is dead. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. What do you mean she's been killed? Oh my God, Nicole is dead. Now is that a question or is that a question? What do you mean she's been killed? They want to make something, I mean, that, is that preposterous? And then he goes on to say, he became upset and made that statement. Then he continued to be upset, continued to talk on the phone to himself. And it took me several seconds to get him to talk to me again, to have him listen to me, and he seemed very upset. And these prosecutors would tell you, oh boy, that's something unusual about that. Find anything unusual about that? What do you think? He just kept repeating over and over again that Nicole had been killed. Eventually, when I got his attention again is when I mentioned the children. You have to remember, this conversation took place very quickly. He was talking, and I was talking, and everybody was a little excited. That's what Philip said. And so, again, what I hope that I've done here is to let you share exactly what the testimony, testimony was. Then I asked Arnell about it. She said he was very upset. He was crying. He was saying, Arnell, I don't understand. 
He was very upset, emotional. Have you ever at any time in your then 25 years heard your father sound like that? Answer, no. She says he was upset, distraught, emotional. Then she describes him on that evening after he comes back from Chicago. He was seated with my grandmother, my Aunt Shirley. Bob Kardashian was there, the family and friends. Some of his friends were coming and going. This was in the family room. Now, with regard to his demeanor and how he appeared, describe again for the jury how he appeared before he left the room to go to some other place. How did he appear to you then? He was just very upset. He was crying off and on. We were watching the news, and he kept talking to the TV saying, you know, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. In shock, upset, and disbelief. And I've read the other part for you about the police officers going in the back door, but she describes how they walk around, and she opens the alarm. She's the one that went in and let the police in, and she's the one who walked in first. And then even Tom Lang, it's a personal favorite of mine, but in his instance, I think there are probably more mistakes than anything else. Human foibles, and seems to be quite different than some of the others. Remember, he told us how he took these tennis shoes that O.J. Simpson told him he was wearing. And I said, what'd you do with those tennis shoes? He said, well, I took the tennis shoes and I put them in the trunk of my car. I was going to take him home for the night because it was too late to book him. Then we looked at this video. And the tennis shoes he got, remember, he put the tennis shoes in the front seat with him. Maybe he stopped halfway up the road on the freeway and put them in the trunk. But that's not what he did then. And then he was part of the group who says O.J. was not a suspect. Turns his head, perhaps. Maybe that's his partner. She knows he wasn't involved in this whole debacle with these Fiato brothers and Agent Wax. He wasn't involved. If he's smarter, he wouldn't let that happen. And you know what? It's interesting because it's his case. That's his case that they're working on. You see him come running in here, trying to cover for anybody. He didn't do that, to his credit. And then we come, before we end today, to Detective Mark Furman. This man is an unspeakable disgrace. He's been unmasked for the whole world for what he is. And that's hopefully positive. His misdeeds go far beyond this case because he bespeaks a culture that's not tolerable in America. But let's talk about this case. People worry about this is not the case of Mark Furman. Well, it's not the case of Mark Furman. Mark Furman is not in custody. He's not. That's the man who they're trying to put away with witnesses like this, a corrupt police officer who is a liar and a perjurer. You know, they were talking yesterday in their argument about, well, they said, well, gee, would you just think he would like, commit a felony? What do you think it was when he was asked the questions by F. Lee Bailey, so well put? And we'll talk about that at the very end, about whether he'd ever used the N-word in 10 years. And he swore to tell the truth. And he lied. And others knew he lied. But what I find particularly troubling is that they all knew about Mark Furman. And they weren't going to tell you. They tried to ease him back. Of all the witnesses who've testified in this case, how many were taken up to the grand jury room where they have this prep session? They ask him all these questions. And Ms. Clark, and I went back and I read again her introduction of, Marsh, of, of Mark Furman. How many witnesses did they do that with? Well, they took him up there and they prepared him for this. Because you see, they knew 
about the Kathleen Bell letter. But she didn't fit. She didn't fit in what they wanted. They didn't want her. They'd rather malign her and believe this lying police officer. So they knew. Make no mistake about it. And so, when they try to prepare him, talk to him, and get him ready, and make him seem like a choir boy, make him come in here and raise his right hand as though he's going to tell you the truth and give you a true story here. He knew he was a liar and a racist. There's something about good versus evil. There's something about truth. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. You can always count on that. And so when Miss Clark so gently puts him on the stand and talks to him about, tell us how you feel about testifying today. Nervous? Okay. Reluctant? And all the things about this bad lady, Kathleen Bell. They brought it out at the beginning. This bad Kathleen Bell saying all these mean things about you. Oh, and you don't, you don't know her even, do you? We ask you to look at her on the Larry King show? And you didn't recognize her. You don't know her. Oh, well, it's just terrible all these bad things are happening to you, Detective Furman. Go back and you look at your notes of how the testimony was as they tried to bring him in here and pass him off. These things were all happening. Kathleen Bell letter was in 85 and 86. Same time he went out to O.J. Simpson's house in 85. That they want to talk so much about. What they're talking about is not even relevant. What we're talking about now is what happened in this case. And so, after having made all these denials and been adopted and accepted by the prosecution and put him on the stand, and you saw it. You saw it. It was sickening. And then, my colleague Lee Bailey, who can't be with us today, but God bless him wherever he is, did his cross-examination of this individual. And he asked some interesting questions. Some of you probably wonder, well, do you wonder why he's asking that? He asked this man whether or not he'd ever met Kathleen Bell. Of course, he lied about that. Never met this woman. I don't recognize her. I don't know her. Gee, I don't know anything about that. Boy, and he sounded really convincing, didn't he? He says, quote, I do not recognize this woman as anybody I have ever met. That's what he says. Then Bailey says, have you used that word, referring to the N-word, in the past 10 years? Not that I recall, no. You mean if you call someone a nigger, you have forgotten it? I'm not sure I can answer the question the way it's phrased, sir, and they go on. He says, Bailey then pins him down. I want you to assume that perhaps at some time since 1985 or 86, you addressed a member of the African-American race as a nigger. Is it possible that you have forgotten that act on your part? Answer, no, it is not possible. Are you therefore saying that you have not used that word in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? Answer, yes, that is what I'm saying. Question, and you say under oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years? Detective Furman, that's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar. Would they not, Detective Furman? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. That's what he told you on growth in this case. Did he lie? Did he lie? Did he lie under oath? Did this key prosecution witness lie under oath? And I'm going to end this part and resume with him tomorrow morning. Did he lie? And when they try to tell you he's not important, let's remember this man. This is the man who was off this case shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning, right after he got on it. This is the man who didn't want to be off this case. This is the man when they're ringing the doorbell at Ashford who goes for a walk. And he describes how he's strolling. Let me quote him for you. Here's what he says. I was just strolling along, looking at the house. Maybe I could see some movement inside. I was just walking while the other three detectives were down there. And that's when he walks down. And he's the one who says, the Bronco was parked askew. And he sees some spot on the door. He makes all 
of the discoveries. It's got to be the big man because he's headed in for O.J. because of his views since 85. This is the man. He's the guy who climbs over the fence. He's the guy who goes in and talks to Cato Kalin while the other detectives are talking to the family. He's the guy who's showing or a light in Cato Kalin's eyes. He's the guy looking at shoes and looking for suspects. He's the guy who's doing these things. He's the guy who says, I don't tell anybody about the thumps on the wall. He's the guy who's off this case, who's supposedly there to help this man, our client, O.J. Simpson, who then goes out all by himself. All by himself. Now, if he's worried about bodies or suspects or whatever, doesn't even take out his gun. He goes around the side of the house, and lo and behold, he claims he finds this glove. And he says the glove is still moist and sticky. Now, under their theory, at 1040, 1045, that glove is dropped. How many hours is that? It's now after 6 o'clock. So what is that, seven and a half hours? It's a testimony about drying time around here. There's no dew point that night. Why would it be moist and sticky? Unless he brought it over there and planted it there to try to make this case. And there is a Caucasian hair on that glove. This man cannot be trusted. He is central to the prosecution. And for them to say he's not important is untrue, and you will not fall for it. Because as guardians of justice here, we can't let it happen. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Scott, could you have the taken down, please? Oh, oh, sorry. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, conclude our evening session at this time. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or any opinions about the case. Conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. All right, thank you, counsel. We're in recess.